Thank you, Senka. Um, so first of all, just a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us uh, today for our first webinar uh, for the Wonka World uh, SIG on Integrative Medicine. Um, just a few housekeeping rules is to make sure that you are muted if you are not speaking, um, and also just to be aware that we will be recorded um, so that we can share this on the Wonka World uh, YouTube um, site. So um, if I could just have the next slide, please, Uma. <clears throat> So essentially when we start, well, the Wonka World SIG is a very new SIG. We started last year and it was from a conversation that I had with Patrick at Wonka, World, Wonka Europe in London, where uh, I was telling him how it would be wonderful if we could have a special interest group where we could share some of our thoughts, um, especially I, I qualified as a yoga teacher at that point, and I, I'm really interested in integrative medicine. Um, and Patrick told me at that time that he practiced uh, traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture. Uh, and I've known Patrick for about nine, eight or nine years, and I'd never known that about him. And it made me realize that perhaps we don't really have a space where we can talk about um, our interests. Um, and from there, having had a conversation with Sanka, who was also interested, um, and he obviously introduced me to Uma, and Dimitrios is another friend of mine from Greece. So we have different interests uh, and different, and we're spread across uh, the world. So there's me, um, as I said, I'm a yoga teacher and I, um, I have a master's in medical anthropology. Uh, there's Patrick who will be joining us later, who uh, practices traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture. We've got a Sanka who um, has done his master's in archaeology, but you may probably know him more better as the former YDM lead, the Young Doctors Movement lead. Uh, we've got Uma, who will be doing the presentation later, who uh, is got a medical degree in SIDA, master's in neuropharmacology, and a fellowship in integrative medicine as well. So he's a wonderful starting speaker for us. And then Dimitrios, who has a, who's from Greece and Cyprus, currently working in Cyprus, sorry, um, who's got a master's in holistic alternative medical systems, diploma in classical homeopathy and certified in biomedical acupuncture. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Uma. So uh, the WHO does have guidance on traditional medicine and we've, we've worked um, sort of using their uh, their definitions. So tra traditional medicine is a sum of the knowledge, skills and practices based on theories, beliefs and experiences, which is indigenous to different cultures. So this is the important part is that it's local to the, to the local culture. Um, whether it's explicable or not, um, it's used in the maintenance of health and the prevention, diagnosis, improvement or treatment of physical and mental illness. And the term complementary medicine or alternative medicine um, is slightly different in that it refers to a broad set of health care practices that are not local. So they're not part of the country's own traditions or conventional medicine and may not be fully integrated into the dominant health care system. And these can be um, used, inter it's, it's almost like you can use it interchangeably with traditional medicine in some cultures. So you may have imported a particular style of medicine. Um, if uh, we could just have the next slide, please, Uma. So traditional complementary medicine can be delivered in three different ways. So one where it is local to your to your culture, so it's local to your country, um, where it's the primary sources of healthcare. You may see that in rural areas where people might tend to go to their local traditional healer before. Um, coming to the, what we would call conventional medicine, um, healthcare um, services. Then you have some countries, uh, for example, Singapore, Republic of Korea, also Japan, where my family is from, uh, where the conventional healthcare system is well established, but uh, traditional medicines may be integrated into those services. And then uh, the, you can also use <clears throat> traditional complementary medicine um, like we do in the UK where I live, uh, which is more a complementary therapy. So it's um so it's used in sort of on top of mm -hmm. in conjunction with the with the traditional medicine, or sorry, with the conventional medicine, um, but unfortunately it may not be integrated very well. Um and 
there is an increase of TCNM in, in Western countries, mainly because of an increased awareness of options. Um, there's also increasing dissatisfaction with existing healthcare services. Perhaps they're not being seen as holistic enough. Um, and there's an increase in uh, interest in whole person care and disease prevention. So focusing on quality of life rather than just being curative. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So uh, traditional medicine and complementary medicine is very common. So 88% of all countries use TCNM. 170 countries worldwide report uh, the use of traditional medicine and acupuncture is the most common. And this is all data that is taken from the WHO. So it is also recognized in 2018 Declaration of Astana um, as is often used in primary healthcare more than secondary healthcare. And then according to 2012 data, lots of industrialized countries now regularly use some form of TS, TC, TN, traditional complementary medicine. Um, so for example, 42% in the United States, 48% in Australia, 49% in France, 70% um, in Canada. And what we do know is that the demand is growing. Next slide, please. Um, so WHO outlined their strategy goals as to support member states in harnessing the potential contribution to health, wellness and people centred um, health care and to promote this. And this is the important part that is safe and effective uh, through the regulation of products, practices and practitioners. Now, UMA will be going through the limitations of uh, traditional complementary medicine later. Thank you. Next slide. So just to introduce you to our SIG, so we're, we're very new, we're, we're celebrating a one year birthday currently. Um, and we have a real vision um, in order to provide a forum for doctors. So as I said, I've known Patrick for nine years and I didn't know that he practiced acupuncture or Chinese medicine. And I want it to be more of a safe space where we can talk about um, our interests. And we, we will be very much in line with the WHO traditional medicine strategy 2014 to 23. Um, and the other thing is, is that perhaps you don't want to practice it yourself, but perhaps you want to understand it better because a lot of our patients are seeking uh, traditional or complementary medicine and being able to discuss with them their options with confidence is something that's very important for the future. So next slide, please. So there's two ways to join. Um, so on the left hand side, the QR code will take you to our website and that will take you to the, um, uh, you can put your details in why you're interested and that will give you, my, give you your details to me and I will be able to stay in touch. Um, on the right hand side is a direct link to our WhatsApp group. Um, and this is our members group where um, you'll be able to have a forum. So that's kind of our initial uh, stages of a forum. And as I said, we are very new. So what we are trying to do is we'd love to we'd love to hear from you on how you would like us just to represent you and what you feel is really important. Um, and then maybe that will help sort of craft our vision. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Uma now, um, who will be running us through uh, what integrative medicine is. Thank you. Hey, um, greetings to everyone. I am uh, Dr. Uma, and I'm really honored to be here with you all today. And thank you, Sonia, for that wonderful introduction of uh, what we're going to go do today. So the topic today that we're going to talk is harmony in healthcare. This was very catchy for me because that's the need of the hour that we need to have that harmonious function within the healthcare system. And uh, before I dwell into the topic, I just want to give a really brief introduction of why I have come to this part of doing integrative medicine. Um, so I am a family physician certified in the United States, but before that, my home country is India, where I had the privilege of doing Indian system of medicine, which is Siddha medicine, which is similar to Ayurvedic medicine. And uh, Having done the Eastern medicine and the Western medicine, I felt there is a gap that I could not integrate what I learned back home and what I learned in the States, and I could not put it together. And that's when I came across this fellowship in integrative medicine in the States, 
which was like really a good bridge on how to integrate the modalities that are evidence informed in different countries. So having done the fellowship in integrative medicine really like opened a lot of avenue for me to um, put things together in practice that really made a difference in patients um, uh, treatment plan. So with that small introduction, I want to move on to, um, to our objectives. These are the objectives today. So we're just going to touch base on why we are going to talk about integrative medicine and um, what are the things that are involved in integrative medicine. Um, this is one of my favorite quote. As you read here, um, it is much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of a disease a patient has. This, this really captured me strong because I want to share a small story as we move along here. Um, this story definitely made uh, the, the difference of why I need to put these things together. So when I practiced Indian systems of medicine back in India, I had a patient who came with me. He was 25 years old, male, um, otherwise healthy, but came for a, a psoriasis lesion that he had all over his body. He had developed the stigma of even showing his face or his skin outside. He used to cover his arms and wear a uh, you know, shirt that really goes up all the way his neck and maybe he'll wear a cap. So he hardly showed any part of his skin outside. He was really um, ashamed to even talk about it. So that's, and he had the lesions all over his body. So when he came to us to get a holistic approach on how he needs to be treated. He has already tried steroids. And at that time, there were not much biologics available in that I practiced. So steroids did not help him much. It was very temporary relief with the steroids. And we, in in Indian system of medicine, the approach is more, um, you know, um, it's not symptom-based, it's more holistic-based. So when we try to approach him with you know, detoxifying him, putting him on certain um, herbals and giving him a, a thorough diet of what he really would need and uh, incorporating some fasting therapy and giving him stress reduction techniques like, you know, mind-body techniques like yoga, putting him on some meditation management. So putting a really holistic approach like that in a matter of six months, believe it or not, he was lesion-free. And until today, this is this happened like 15 years ago, I would say. And until today, he has been following certain diet that we really discussed on that day. And he has not had those lesions as of yet. So he has been doing really well. The the the, the reason I shared this story because this this really sparked a thing in my mind that, you know, yes, steroids are good to kind of control the symptoms at that time. But how do you do what do you do to avoid getting the lesions again? That was a question I had. Um, uh, being a family physician, see, I have respect for all field of medicine. And I applaud my, you know, commend my colleagues in different specialties within the conventional, conventional medicine. But the topic today is mainly to see how we can get the best of each system. Because as physicians, I strongly believe that we need to know where do we have the limitations and when do we start thinking otherwise. So that's the whole idea of having the knowledge of integrative medicine. So as you see here, um, WHO strongly says that, you know, um, there is a lot of, uh, you know, um, steps taken by WHO in the last few years to regulate the policies in traditional complementary and integrative medicine. And recently they opened a center for TCIM, Traditional Center for Integrative Medicine, which, which happened in Gujarat, India, which is like a huge step forward to kind of bring all systems together so that it benefits the patient not the system. So, and why do we need to really do that? As I was telling you, um, see, in the current model of healthcare, we are trying to put a bandaid on the problem to be um, straight enough. So we are really not um, addressing the underlying cause, but just repairing the part that has been uh, affected. So even after all of this, we see less success in treatment of especially the chronic medical um, dis uh, conditions. And um, even though the healthcare system is expensive in many parts of the uh, globe, it's still you have like poor health outcomes. And yes, technology has improved a lot as, uh, as of now to AI interventions. We have come a long way that also has given 
uh, a part of this uh, communication with the patient has gone down, the building of repo has gone down. So to kind of put these two things together, I strongly believe IEM would be the um, future of medicine. So who doesn't like cartoons? So I picked it here because we all think like if we know a medication fits one person, we think it, it's going to work for the other one too, but that's not the case. So personalized integrated care is the future of medicine, I would say, because we have come to the modern um, you know, definitions of precision medicine, personalized medicine. As we know, like we as human beings, we are all unique and we all have like a beautiful blueprint that needs a personalized or tailor-made approach. So one size does not fit all. Just because just because metformin works for someone doesn't mean it will work for the other. Just because a supplement works for a person doesn't mean it will work for the other person. So you have to really understand and um, you know go into the root cause of the issue in that particular patient and tailor make things for them. Um, so coming to the introduction of integrative medicine, it's a beautiful blend of conventional medicine with all the other evidence-informed alternative or complementary therapies across the globe, and how do we put it together? We just don't focus only on the uh, physical body. We also take into many other parameters, um, mind, body, spirit. We consider the lifestyle of the patient, environmental factors, also the genetic factors. So we take so many things into con consideration before we devise a treatment plan. So integrative medicine really like you know blends the best of all the uh, uh, tra treatments across the globe. And this is the wellness tree. It's a beautiful, um, you know, um, picture. Like, you know, all chronic diseases may be, you know, arthritis, diabetes, um, autoimmune diseases, um, you know, obesity, all of this, it's the, the, we see the disease on the surface, but as physicians, most of the times it's missed down in the root. What is the real cause? Did we talk about the emotions? Did we look at the inflammatory markers? Did we talk about any imbalance in the detoxification system, the digestive system, or the structural and immune system? So we need to get to the root of the um, cause of the issue and address it right from there. And, um, and it all starts with education, right? So um, there are some, you know, certifying bodies across the globe. I picked this because that's where um, I graduated from. So American Board of Inter Integrative Medicine is a certifying body in US, and there is also Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. And there are many fellowships in integrative medicine across the globe, and I just listed a few here. Um, there are specific courses in London, in Australia, and in Europe, and there is International College of Integrative Medicine, which is a available across the um, globe and there are many fellowships in integrative medicine these are like different states in the um, united states that they offer fellowships and are like a certification course in integrative medicine having that knowledge only helps you know uh, for us to at least tell our patients hey this is the limitation for what i'm offering you maybe you should go see this person so that much of knowledge is important for a physician when we treat a patients with chronic diseases. So what is the benefit of integrative medicine, honestly? So we are just not treating the symptom here. We are just not treating only the problem here. We are healing them inside out. That's the beauty of the integrative medicine. So starting from lifestyle choices, how do you reduce your um, stress? Because all of these factors are so inter interwined and interlinked with their current medical issues. So Addressing each and every one of that will uh, will definitely lead to a more um, you know healthier life and addresses the well being of the patient. And what are the modalities in integrative medicine? There are many many things that we learn in integrative medicine. I just listed a few here. Of course, conventional medicine is a part of it, and we'll also talk about botanicals, which includes different herbal supplements across the globe that are evidence based. And then there are Indian systems of medicine like Siddha, Ayurveda, and there is homeopathy. And traditional Chinese medicine is included, acupuncture, massage therapy, yoga therapy, and mind-body therapies like biofeedback, stress reduction. We also talk about energy healing, like pranic healing, Reiki healing. Um, these kind of therapies come so well in hand when you see like for anxiety and depression, you can give them antidepressants, but when you club these things together, it really speeds up the recovery of the patient and speeds up the healing. So 
I mean, every system has a limitation. I just wanted to mention what are the limitations in the integrative medicine, as we know that this is a novel field that is slowly growing, but definitely widely growing. The challenge we face here is mainly the lack of regulation in many of the things, uh, many of the treatment modalities or the supplements that we use. There is a little lack of regulation there. It is not as tight as the conventional medicine where they go through uh, different uh, governing bodies to get it uh, to the market. But here, uh, the rules and regulations are a little slacky. So that leads to you know, inconsistencies in the quality of the treatment as well as the safe safety standards of the treatment. So it's a work in progress. And uh, we need to know that there are interactions with any medications that we take if we put them together. So understanding like if you're giving a supplement of turmeric or quercetin, what is interaction with the metformin they are taking? So we need to know that base knowledge so that we are prescribing things safely to the patient. I just put in a web link there. This has an excellent database of uh, what are the different supplements and what are the other conventional medications. And you can plug in both and you can see what are the interactions between them. Can you give it to the, can you give it to the patients or not? So that much information is available in this uh, web link. And it really comes in handy when you become a practitioner in integrative medicine. So um, Sonia, do we still have time? Can I move on? Yeah. Okay. So I just um, brought in a case study here because um, when you when you listen to a patient's story and how they um, you know get better with these kind of modalities, it really strikes a big um, you know impact uh, on the audience. So I just wanted to share this story. Um, this is a patient who is fifty year forty year old. Um, she comes with a, a chief complaint of fatigue, seasonal allergies, and urticaria. Um, so the go when she came in, um, she had all these symptoms of fatigue, sneezing, itchy and watery eyes. She had fullness in the sinus and she had some lesions and topical hives. So her story, see, I um, it's always as we all know, like the history taking solves fifty percent of the um, you know, problem. So good history taking is important um, when we deal with chronic medical conditions. So all of Michelle's the patient symptoms began oh, like right. all of her symptoms began six months ago when she moved from uh, one one state to another state where she lived after after twenty years of living in a place she moved to a new place and she also had gone through like um, high stress traumatic divorce and she moved with her young son. Um, to live with her parents across the country. So this is something she shared. And during her initial visit, her stress level was seven out of 10. And she was sleeping eight hours a, night, a day. And then her energy level was like five on 10. Um, she was not motivated um, or she was not feeling energetic when she woke up. So um, history taking also involves about her diet. So when we talked about her diet, she was um, sharing that she was a vegetarian for the last eight years avoiding um, dairy due to bloating and the GI discomfort um, it caused. And she had done IgA panel. Um, and based on that, she had removed certain um, triggering foods, but she has not reintroduced those foods yet. So with this history, um, we all can agree that, you know, the conventional approach we have, we start with antihistamines, oral antihistamines, and then we use nasal spray and the next step would be a steroid spray. And then moving on, um, you know, we use the chromolin muscle inhibitors. Um, and then uh, we use the um, antihistamine sprays. If nothing works, we go to the injection immunotherapy, which is the subcutaneous immunotherapy, the skid therapy. We use the allergy shots. So this is the step-by-step -step conventional treatment. Um, in, in spite of all of this treatment, patients can still have the symptoms if, if they are not... Uh, you know, regular enough to taking it, or if, you know, even after chronic use, they will still have all the symptoms as it is. So she was in that stage that, you know, in spite of trying different things, she was still not feeling better. So in integrated approach, um, what we try to do is we get, um, uh, you know, good lab testing for her gut health. I will tell you why we do the gut health when she came for just the allergies and sinus infections. And then we do a detox and we do a targeted diet therapy, and we do the respiratory immune uh, support modalities. And we also talk about how to prevent another flare up of her symptoms. 
So we did the, the first one is the lab testing for the GI health. We did the comprehensive stool panel, which showed these, these parameters. Her fecal fat was low. Her uh, fecal secretory IgA was um, elevated. Short chain fatty acids were low. And there were some um, beneficial bacteria in her gut. And the food sensitivity panel showed she was allergic to quite few foods. And we made a note of that. And uh, her lab, based on her lab work, you know, there are three different things that we need to focus here. Though I didn't share the iron levels, her iron level was high, which uh, tells me that she had iron overload syndrome, which caused the tiredness and the fatigue that she was complaining when she woke up. Secretory IgA, uh, which is the marker of high inflammation in her gut. And then she being vegetarian, focusing heavily on, on the specific beans, lentils, legumes, and all of which had caused her low level immune system reactions. So how do we get the histamine intolerance? So the uh, enzyme, the DAO, which is responsible for breaking down the histamine. Um, if that is deficient, we are gonna have histamine intolerance. And this is one um, you know, um, slide that talks about um, how do we get that um, situation of having the symptoms showing up um, in some and why not in others. So it it really comes back to the type of food the patients are consuming, what are the stress factors, how, how is their lifestyle, and how is env environmental factors. So these are the big factors that come into play that really affects the system um, bringing the imbalance. Um, so liver and the body's detoxification pathways are very much affected when these uh, when these factors fill the bucket. So here, um, the reason for the DAO enzyme deficiency, we say it is uh, GI disorders, mainly the leaky gut syndrome, IBS, SIBO, those kind of uh, you know, disorders can cause this deficiency, nutritional deficiency, and uh, medications that block the DAO functions like you know, any pain medications, antibiotics, narcotics, et cetera. So I do not want this to be a medical lecture. The reason I'm telling this because um, this DAO enzyme deficiency is where we are targeting to make her better, um, you know, inside out. So addressing her GI system, addressing the deficiencies in her nutrition and avoiding things that can trigger these deficiencies is the way that we approach the treatment. Um, so when I talked about the second one is the detox. How do we detox? Um, so in Ayurveda, we call um, panchakarma, which is like five different actions we do. Um, to cleanse the body. So in this patient, virechen, which is like um, purgation, like, you know, you give uh, medicated powder paste um, that cleanses the bowel. And then we also did nasia, which is nasal clearance using like herbal remedies, oils and fumes. So when we do, when we start with that, the body gets, you know, um, reset um, to take the prescriptions that you're going to give. So resetting your body is important when we do in an integrated way. Um, this is something that, um, you know, highly recommended for patients who have these kind of symptoms. The detox tea stands for, CCFT stands for these three um, herbs that is used, coriander, cumin, and fennel, which is one of my favorite tea. Um, the, this really acts as a good detoxifying agent, it cleanses the bowels. So it's very simple, harmless. It doesn't interact with any medications. Um, so taking this tea um, two, two times a day is the good way to um, you know, start the detox process. And um, we did doing a targeted diet therapy. So we started with the detox and then we did the diet therapy. Main thing is to avoiding the triggers with, you know, avoiding cold foods, you know, heavy processed foods, and then uh, uh, recommending eating like warm, light, natural cooked foods. Um, that is very gentle on the stomach. And then recommending few spices like, you know, ginger, cinnamon, black pepper, turmeric, cumin. These spices are, we call it as warming spices, meaning that it helps to reduce the um, imbalances in the body that aggravates the symptoms of allergies. And these spices not just um, do one action, they have multiple, um, you know, um, multiple way of acting in your body that helps with reducing the inflammation. So 
it's more of a diet therapy it's not a medication so we can introduce any of these spices based on the patient's uh, you know needs um and it it is it is more of a holistic healing i would say and this is huge when it comes to any chronic issues and looking at the microbiome it it is a must must uh, thing that every patient has to understand you know keeping the gut so uh, healthy solves a lot of health issues so looking at her panel she had good amount of bacteria but there was you know um the function of the bacteria was not to the par so adjusting the um you know probiotic level by giving her right um, amount of fibers and uh, um, adding some probiotics in terms of diet that comes a long way again. So how do they act is like, you know, they help regulate the uh, immune system with, you know, interleukins and cytokines. And also, you know, um, the release of histamine is well regulated when you take um, good amount of fiber. And fiber is a uh, food for the bacteria in the gut. And uh, we also recommend DAO supplement, which is available if DA approved and recommending the nutritional deficiencies, I mean, addressing the nutritional deficiencies with the micronutrients like copper, B6, vitamin C, which really helps with the degradation of histamine and the enzyme production. And quercetin, it's a, um, it's a plant alkaloid. It's very well known for amino um, allergies. It's a mast cell stabilizer, just like uh, Montelukast. Um, it decreases the histamine level. So um, definitely recommended as a supplement. Um, apart from the you know oral therapy, we also recommend external therapies to support the immune system. One of my favorite is the nati pot, which is um, highly recommended when there is frequent you know infections every season. Like you know when the flu season starts, every flu season patients get flu. Then you can recommend these external therapies, which is totally <coughs> doing the nati pot daily. Um, with it's like a saline rinse of your nasal passages. It really helps to cleanse your nasal passages and it is it has salt water and so it kind of you know salt water is antimicrobial it helps to protect the immunity of the nasal passages mm -hmm. and then practicing nasia nasia is like you know the fumes that you can smell with the herbal uh, oils added to your in the humidifier or you can burn some uh, um, the uh, eucalyptus oil like an uh, aromatherapy so those were uh, recommended and uh, a prevention, when it comes to prevention, um, you know, continuing certain herbs that are anti-inflammatory and following the strict diet for a longer period of time. And then pranayama, which is an excellent breathing technique, which really enhances and opens up a lot of the, um, you know, lower lung field. So we highly recommend for any uh, breathing disorders or seasonal allergies, pranayama really goes a long way to enhance the uh, respiratory system and then definitely for lifestyle changes included exercise 30 minutes a day it can be of any kind but the consistency is what we really talk about whatever style of exercise you like but do it consistently um, and then environmental support is also important looking at you know um, the putting a good purifier in the bedroom making sure the sheets are clean and some of these um, uh, things if you could address that helps in prevention of you know um, the, the issue and uh, say the the reason I went in a little deeper into different modalities that were used here is mainly because um, I feel like when the best therapies have when we put it together it not only solves the problem but it prevents it come prevents it from coming back again so um, addressing the GI inflammation addressing the probiotics uh, really went a long way with this patient um, and uh, these are my expenses and I really thank you for patiently listening to me and I'm happy to take any questions um, after the session is done um, so thank you all Thank you, Mo, for a really fascinating uh, uh, presentation. Um, we already have one question in the um, comment box for you. Um, it's from Innes, um, who's asking, do you have um, any, do you recommend any specific certification? Um, there are many, it depends on the duration um, that you have, like some certifications are six months, some of them, the fellowships are like quite long, they go for two years. 
So it depends really on what you're looking for and uh, what is the uh, end goal of uh, you know um, treatment you're going to practice. Are you going to be a coach? There are because there are some universities they offer like integrative medicine coach, which is like you can help a physician. Um, you know uh, you can work along with a physician and you can coach the patient on these integrative modalities. So the different ways of doing this uh, course. And uh, recommendation wise, I mean, I don't want to be biased, but where I, I did my fellowship from University of Arizona, they have a really strong program. And uh, um, to be honest, Dr. Andrew Whale, he, he called as a guru of, uh, you know, uh, integrative medicine. They have a solid program and the intake is like 150 to 200 medical doctors who joined the program from different specialties. Like I had uh, rheumatology, oncology, and so many other specialties were my fellows. So, um, as, as I said, like the duration and, of course, the financial factor and why do you really want to do this integrative medicine? So those are the things that will determine where you want to do it. I hope I answered the question. Any, any other question? Yes, there's another question from uh, Brando. Uh, says the use of probiotics has been a trend now in some countries. The more common example is kombucha. Do you have mm -hmm. any information on the specific use of it for certain kind of pathology? Great question. So kombucha, I know it's like a fancy drink and it's very, very popular across the world. Uh, it's one of the fermented drinks. Um, see, with probiotics, I always uh, recommend, you know, um, taking it with caution because you want to know why you're taking it and what strain of bacteria you really want to take it. So it's just not all probiotics are going to make things better. So you have to understand, is it for the gut? Is it for your skin? Is it for your liver? So you need to understand why you're taking it. And um, coming to fermented drinks, yes, they are good as probiotics. But again, um, is it suitable for you is the question. So I would not... Uh, bluntly say everybody can drink kombucha but the, because some cannot tolerate the taste of it it's more acidic for some people so you really have to um, weigh in the situation and do it but there are many fermented drinks that you can do not just kombucha uh, for example um, the rice water it's a very popular um, drink from um, you know asia which is uh, cook, cooked rice that is soaked overnight and uh, you add some um the buttermilk and a little bit of salt and you drink it in the morning just the water that's an excellent fermented drink which is an excellent probiotic so uh, there are so many different probiotic uh, drinks that you can do but yes having probiotic in some form in your diet is always a good idea yeah. thank you Uma. Um, I have a, another question from Maria um, who says is there any evidence for detox tea so I do not have a specific evidence for the CCFT, but there are lots of evidence for the the in individual ingredients for cumin, for coriander, and for the fennel seeds. You do have evidence that they help with indigestion. People who have constipation, when they take it, they really have good bowel movements. Um, so that's where uh, you need to really focus. If any patient who has constipation, clear cut, they do not have a healthy gut. So addressing that with CCFT is definitely going to go a long way. So again, I can you know look up and share some evidences if I come across. We can take your name and we can definitely share if we come across good uh, uh, research papers. But as of now, um, I, I don't recall anything that is done specifically with all these three ingredients together. Thank you. I've got a question from Natalie. Um, Dr. Uma, how could we divide integrative medicine, complementary medicine, traditional medicines, neural medicines, and naturopathy? Thank you. How could we divide? I guess the question is how can we, because integrative medicine will cover several areas, very distinct areas as well. So how can we divide integrative medicine, complementary medicine, traditional medicines, and naturopathy? Um, so the beauty of the integrative medicine is it's a huge umbrella that brings in all these modalities together. So it doesn't differentiate uh, one system over the other, but it brings in the best from all the other systems. So 
um, we learn about mud therapy in which is naturopathy, and then we learn about uh, TCM. There are specific uh, Chinese medicine herbs that is included in the uh, curriculum of integrative medicine. So it is well designed that you pick the best of each modality and you bring it together. I also wonder, just to add to that, Uma, perhaps... Add anything, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so. Just to say, perhaps one particular part of integrative medicine might work for you as a practitioner, but other ones might not. And I suppose you can advertise yourself depending on what your interests are. Absolutely. Absolutely. So integrative medicine is a toolkit, like you can pick and choose what tool is right for the patient, you know. So that's the beauty of it. And having the knowledge of, you know, the knowing the limitations, when to stop, you know, when to introduce the other one, that comes a long way for, uh, you know, disease management. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I've got one question for you, Uma. Um, yeah. I, so I'm I'm a big believer in nutrition first, like food first. Um, but I do see a lot of supplements um, that are very becoming increasingly popular. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about supplement use? Great question. It's a billion dollar question. <laughs> so the market of supplements is billion dollars. So uh, more than that. So yeah, see, supplements are good when there is a deficiency. Um, but as you clearly said, um, you are what you eat. So food is medicine. Um, so the, if, if the patient is able to take oral, um, then I would recommend giving whatever supplements you want to give in food form, okay, uh, rather than introducing the supplement right away. Um, try to get the sources of the minerals or micronutrients from the diet. And if that is impossible, if the patient is not able to go that route, then yes. And but again, if the factor of the micronutrient that we're talking about is extremely low, say, for example, you know, calcium or magnesium, if it's really low and they're having the symptomatic presentation, then obviously you want to supplement them. Again, sourcing of the supplement is very important, Sonia, like where you're getting the supplements from. Are they well-sourced? Are they well-made? Uh, what is the quality control they go through? Those are the things we really look into uh, when we put patients on supplements. Did I answer your question? It is, as you say, a very big industry. Um, uh, and I've got another question from Sanka, who has asked um, about um, our thoughts on evidence-based in integrative medicine. Obviously, it's got centuries of um, experience and knowledge base. Um, do we have any thoughts on evidence-based and research? Yeah, um, great question. See, that's where we, we are working more towards that because the field is so vast. And we need to, you know, put this together. As I said, it, it has to be integrated in a better way. And I think we are in the right track of, you know, bringing in more evidence-based information. Um, and that's when um, the scientific world will accept it. And that's when we also feel confident in telling this to our patients. So that's the way we are marching towards, but we are there, not there yet. So um, I think... If we keep progressing the same way we are doing now, bringing in more evidence informed, doing more uh, clinical trials and case studies, and these are the ways that we can, you know, put this together in a well informed way for the scientific community. And just to add to that, um, so from an anthropological perspective, it's very difficult to do head to head trials often with uh, sort of certain compounds and certain medications, um, mainly because I feel that lots of others with more traditional and complementary medicine is much more holistic um, and may have more variables. It's very difficult to put into a straightforward randomized control trial. So I agree there's, there's a lot that research needs to catch up on. Um, I just wanted to say here, just to say thank you to Anna for, she's been very busy translating for all of us, for the Spanish speaking community on our um, webinar. Um, we're absolutely delighted to have you and like big thanks for, for all your hard work. Um, so Uma, if you just, could just mind going back to that slide with the two QR codes on it, if possible. Um, so sort of one of the things, oh, hang on, there's one more question here from uh, Gary. 
He used the phrase evidence informed on several occasions, which is much more realistic and meaningful term than evidence based. Such evidence also includes the many years of traditional usage and clinical experience. That you completely agree. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, so just to go back to um, sort of the SIG, um, obviously, as I said, we're, we're still finding our feet and we're still trying to find a direction forward. Um, if you can join us, and that'd be fantastic, um, you can help shape our direction. Um, if on the left hand side is a QR code on how to join, it's based on the Wonka website, and, and you can put your details in, and your details will come to me um, and I can contact you. Um, alternatively, you can join our Hi, group on the WhatsApp group on the right hand side. Um, um, Yes, and then we can keep in touch. We hope we'll, we will be in touch again. We're hoping to do um, more webinars in the future, um, but obviously we will be in touch. Um, just one more thing. There is a Wonka um, portal, membership portal as well, which you can sign up to. Um, you can, uh, by signing up to it as a community member, it is for free. Um, and it's, it's almost like a Wonka Facebook page as well. So it's a nice place to have um, a community, a forum, um, we can put up our um, events, etc. on there. So it's another it's another place that you can join us. All right. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Uma for a wonderful presentation. Thank you to Anna for the uh, uh, brilliant translation. And thank you to everyone for turning up uh, and spending your afternoon, morning, evening with us. Um, <laughs> And I think that's, and also to thank you to Sankar as well, who's been our technical support throughout the whole thing. And um, very kind. Great. So with all of that, I hope everyone has a very good rest of day. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.